Berachim Abayim, and welcome to Torah Talks Chazak's Tuesday night program with a special guest. Tonight we have with us a very, very special guest, a dear friend of Chazak, Rabbi Asaf Chaimo. Shalom Aleichem. Thank you, Rabbi. How's everything? Thanks for having me. I of appreciate course. it. Baruch Hashem, things are great. Ah, Amen. And uh, tonight we're going to be turning, t- talking about the turning pain into purpose. Yes. And uh, before we talk about tonight's topic, we give the, a little bit of background about the rabbi and the great work you're involved with. Okay, so a little bit about myself, my background. Okay, Saf Chaimov, pleasure. <laughs> Everyone in uh, Queens, the Chaimov last name needs no introduction, right? for the people okay. outside of Queens, maybe. <laughs> um, so uh, I was born and raised in Queens, New York, uh, in Jamaica States, and then moved oh, on to Kewgarden Hills. That I didn't, okay. Yes, I, grew, I was born there, and my parents made Aliyah to Kewgarden Hills. <laughs> When I remember I was in fourth grade, my father started his Beknesset, his Kihila. All Simcha. Yeah, all Simcha. And took it to a whole new level, a whole new dimension. Uh, of, you know, for all those who know the history. you know, with the, First real Makam Torah for the Sephardic community. I'm sorry if you're... Correct. <laughs> That's what he's done. He created a Makam Torah for the Sephardic uh, uh, community here in Queens. Uh, uh, put out a lot of good color guys. Put out new, all the new Rabbeim, the yeshivas today, all the young sure. generation, all students from all Simcha. That's right. My brother and was in that color over there. Correct. That's where I met Rabbi Aaron. Rabbi Walken Ilan Mira top. was there. That's Rabbi right. Walken was there. That's right. Correct. That's Rabbi Israeli came. Israeli was there. Everyone at all Simcha. But. Correct. So all, all, everything that's taking place today in the community all start off in all Simcha, and I'm privileged to to see that growing up. I was privileged to. I am privileged to be a son of a father that lives for Klal Yisrael. And uh, has given all his strength and still does continuously for Klal Yisrael. So seeing that as a kid growing up made an impact on me um, to pretty much carry out um, that lifestyle. Not on his level, of course, because uh, you know he's 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 working with a different crowd. Um, but I did uh, grow up in Queens. I learned in local schools. Continued to South Fallsburg Yeshiva. I learned in Fallsburg for years. That's nice. correct. Um, and then I carried on to Eretz Yisrael. I was in the mirror. I got married in Eretz Yisrael. I was there for about nine years. Oh. And I, then I carried on to Rabbi Berkowitz, to Jerusalem Kolel. And there we, we became Musmach. There oh. we learned everything we needed to, I mean, well, a big amount of our uh, a way of thinking and the tools we need in order to strengthen ourselves, our families, and Kolel Yisrael has been originated in that kyle i mean a I lot came, of young rabbis a lot, they do a lot of good work Yisrael, they do yes. an awesome work for college Yisrael. they produce top guys good guys who go out there and i was lucky to come back to new york a lot of my friends moved to to you know to, to irani dachas you know <laughs> excuse me they're going irichaika irani dachas and they're turning lives around. They're doing phenomenal work, and um, God bless them. God yeah. bless them. I don't know if I'd be able to go to those places. You know, I have, uh, <laughs> you know, I've, I, I don't know. I, it's they're cut out for it. Baruch they went there. I needed to be in a place where there's a lot family. of Tyra, f- family. We have a different infrastructure. You know what I'm saying? And and uh, I was like to that Baruch Hashem, You know, so I moved back to New York, and um, I uh, started doing a lot of cure work here in, in Queens. And as my kids got older, we moved to Brooklyn. And- uh, They're Jews in Brooklyn? Sorry? They're Jews in Brooklyn? (laughs) (laughs) But uh, we moved to Brooklyn and my kids are all learning in the same yeshiva. We we moved to Brooklyn for that yeshiva. Um, You know, they're in the Syrian community there and they're doing phenomenal. Your wife's from that community. My wife is from the Syrian community and you know, she wanted the kids to be in that school setting and we did the move with with Das Torah, of course, and it's the best move I've done. Can I now have, you know, 10 children out of 10, um, though, I mean, most of them are in school, the other ones are little, but they're all doing great. Uh, Four years ago, my life has completely changed to the better, Baruch Hashem, through a major experience of, excuse me, through an experience of heavy, heavy, heavy darkness and pretty much living in exile. That has changed my life to the better. I am a different person today. I am a better person. I'm more of a uh, um, sensitive person uh, and because of the ordeal which I've been through. And that is I had a daughter who suffered for a while with uh, AML leukemia. On her birthday, she um, was, di- uh, she, I mean, we got the news on her birthday. It was a Shabbat during lunch. Oh, wow. The doctor came knocking on our door 
and he's all like pale and he's shivering and I'm like, relax, what, you know, what, what's going on? Oh, wow. And he told me that, um, that my daughter, Fra, my oldest daughter, has been diagnosed with leukemia, AML leukemia, which is for those who don't know or um, it's better not to know, uh, but be. AML leukemia is the worst, one of the worst leukemias a person can get, especially, you know, she, she's a kid. It, you know, it's more Tell common by thing. adults. You know, and she was on her 16th birthday. Oh, wow. It was on her 16th birthday, Shabbat. I remember a doctor came to our house and he's like, you, you have an hour and a half to two hours to put on blood. She needed blood transfusion. She needs to get new cells and whatever. And I told him how much time? He says, two hours. I said, thank you. We were in the middle of doing Hamotzi. Um, I got back to the table, continued this suda with my children, saying with my sons, say Divrei Torah. And why should my daughter know that, you know, that, you know, that it continued like nothing happened. And I remember right after my sister was with us, her husband was away on business. So she was having Shabbat lunch with us and uh, we call Hatala and, and we send all the kids upstairs with my sister and my wife and my daughter and myself went in Hatala to the hospital. And that was our new haven for the next two years and a month. Oh, wow. And then, um, you know, she got better and then as she relapsed and then she, uh, then she did a bone marrow transplant and then relapsed again. And eventually the leukemia and combined with infections got the best of her and she passed away on the week of Rosh Hashanah. Uh, two days before Rosh Hashanah, she passed away and she was zaycha to be buried in Har Menuchot on Erev Shabbat, wow. Erev Rosh Hashanah, two years ago. And since that period to where I am today, my life has completely changed and I was zoha to abnormal blessings in my life. And I believe that that is because um, my experience which I've been through. Wow. That's, that's where I am today. But when you're saying with the you. rabbi open up uh, a, some sort of a center in, in her name. Correct. Um, and since her passing, Rabbi Meir have helped us with a, with a campaign. We yes. started, we oh, did a campaign shit. for my daughter. And we were able to raise funds to be able to get her a safe Torah, something which she very much wanted during her life. She requested a safe Torah. That's Make-A-Wish Foundation asked her, what would you like? They do this with all their sick patients. What would you like? And she thought of that and she thought for, so we're gonna go to South Africa to see the animals. Uh, we're gonna go to Eretz Israel. You know, each one, each high lifeline volunteer was persuading her a different way. And then she thought about it and she said, Abba, I decide what I want. I remember the conversation until today. She was attached to all these tubes and everything, and she was barely speaking. And she said, I want a Sefer Torah because what more unique item than a Sefer Torah? You know what I'm saying? Like, Shal, she said, Abba, you can always buy tickets and go. It's not unique. Uh, safari animals, I, 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 you know, I, I see it in the Parakshir, in the art school Parakshir. <laughs> They're nice, beautiful looking animals. Picture. You know what I'm saying? They even added some features to it. You know, so I, I'm saying, I don't, I don't, uh, you know, these things aren't unique. I, I'd rather have something which is everlasting, well, and that's a Sefer Torah. Wow. And I remember having this conversation with uh, Make-A-Wish people and they're like, it wasn't such an easy thing, but the way I sold it to them is by telling them, look, you give her this request, that's her wish. Right. It's what it's about. That's what it's about. But keep in mind that she is deriving 100% benefit from the grant which uh, she will be getting from Make-A-Wish Foundation. As opposed to if you flew us all, all on a vacation, She's getting 20% of it and we're getting the other 80. You know, we're a big family here. You know, I think twice where you want to give us a grant. We're, we're a bunch of kids and, you know, and, and adults and whatever. And it worked. She got back to us, the lady from Make-A-Wish. She's like, yeah, I spoke to my higher ups. And even though they never done this before, well, we, we like the idea because it's only going 100% to all the dollars which they're allocating to this uh, 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 patient is going 100% to the patient. That's something they don't normally get. So that worked. And we were like to make a beautiful Akhnasat Sefer Torah for her. And we use uh, extra funds, which are the surplus funds to start a Bet Midrash in Brooklyn. We started a beautiful shul um, with many families, all the young kids uh, um, have joined the Kihila, they have joined, joined our new uh, Bet Midrash called Bedere Hefra, right? And um, we do a lot of kids programs. We're taking them to American Dream next week, uh -huh. Hashem, yes, you know, for Hanukkah. Uh, and, um, you know, we, we have the right families, you know, I, I work very hard there and it's my passion because my daughter was a child that passed away at 18. 
So my heart's in the children there. So right. I give them what you know what they deserve, and that is amazing programs, good food, geshmaka challenge, and of course, top-notch learning. There's a lot of rabbin they're teaching, amazing. and it built up from nothing. We started on literally Pesach, and we are seven months later. We have like seventy or eighty families yeah. who are are involved with the with the kahal. Yes, that's, that's amazing. So, yeah, so, that's, so in essence, you took your pain rabbi and you turned it into a purpose, and and maybe you could elaborate a little bit more how how you did that it's just so when i was living in the hospital and my daughter's situation was already at the end i remember the doctor sat us down it was a zoom call like the screen there of COVID, right? right i'm sitting oh. here in one chair and my daughter sitting next to me in the other chair we're both wearing masks five doctors on the screen and the doctor tells us and my wife is not even allowed in the hospital because you can only have one parent per, per child oh, wow. they're about to give us news which are going to change our lives forever but the second parent can't be there stammer shine so my wife's face is also on the screen she was sitting downstairs outside in the parking lot and the doctors are telling us that look you're they straight to my daughter i'll get to the point he doctor says talking straight to my daughter saying that you're chances for long, long-term survival are close to zero those were his words i remember till today your chances for long-term survival are close to zero. And that is because we weren't successful with chemotherapy and we weren't successful with a bone marrow transplant. So we have nothing else to offer you. We could try to give you all these new novel drugs, which are, you know, have been, not been tested yet, not FDA approved. You wanna to contribute to society. So when you die, we know it didn't work. Or if you do make it, we'll know what did work. Either way, you'll be contributing to society or you can go home and enjoy quality of life. And of course, she, we decided that we're going to just fight as much as we can in the hospital. It's just she need to pass away. She shouldn't freak anyone else out in the house and let her pass away, like I mentioned, in the hospital. And I remember at that time, it was um, the, the first time she got sick, I remember I was very angry. And I remember saying to myself, my father was sick two years prior right, to that. It was a miracle. And yeah, he yeah. almost died. All right. He was on a respirator. And I remember looking at him and said, is this the reward a person gets for teaching tire for, for 35 years? You know, is this... Yeah. You know, I, I didn't grow up with the father at home, really. He was always out doing care of whatever. I never really, I, I mean, I had an hour a day with him for learning only. But other than that, once, uh, 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 twice a year, Chalamite, he took his bowling, I remember till today, with his beard and pants <laughs> and, and spinning, you know, 250s, you know, uh, making strikes, you know. Uh. But in the end of the day, my, uh, I remember looking, I was very young at the time, young. I was young, I was immature in my mind. And I was asking, is this the reward for a person to teach his tire? And when my daughter got sick, I remember asking the same question, like, why is this happening to her? Let it happen to, to, to a gaita, you know, uh, who abuses her health uh, with drugs and, and you know, and, and eats dvara masurim. She should suffer. Why should my daughter, who's a tzadegas, have to go through this? And um, I, I, that, that when I said, and then I said, I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to get the best doctors. I'm going to get the best. And three weeks into my plan, I realized it's not happening. It's going backwards and I was getting exhausted, I realized that the cancer is not my Nisayon. Something is off here. And I come to learn that there's a God who runs the world. And my job is not to try to control her situation, but to do me Shadlu together, the best doctors, and allow God to do his things between God and my daughter and the doctor, and I'm out. And uh, you know, the, the, Baruch Hashem, she got better. Second time around, I was not experiencing anger, but I sort of surrendered. I said, Hashem, you run the world. If this is your will, I get it. I wish things were different. Um, but, you know, it's unfortunate. But if that's how you want it, that's how it's going to be. The third time around, Rabbi Walken, Robert Shlita, Walken. Rabbi yes. Walken, who is uh, the director working the director of the teens for Chazak, who's my, been my Rebbe from, from literally since I'm my bar mitzvah. Wow. And we talk every day, multiple times has taught me that perhaps now your outlook should be a little different. And that is, thank Hashem for your daughter's situation. Learn to say thank you. And I remember I said, Rebbe, that's something I can't do because I don't believe what I'm going to be saying. See, he taught me a concept. He goes, hey, just believe, just say the words, even though you don't mean it. And eventually you're going to believe the words you say. For instance, a guy who lies, the first few times he knows he's a liar, but eventually he starts to believe his lies and mm. thinks everyone around him is dysfunctional. <laughs> Narcissists, that's how they live their lives, right? Or, you know, serial liars and robbers. They, the first few times they knew they're doing something which is against the law. But eventually they, they looked at themselves that they're doing a 
the right thing and they're doing a justice and everyone around them who's trying to stop them are dysfunctional. <laughs> they start believing their own lies. And that is the punishment of, of a liar that he's never believed. Why? Because once you start believing your lies, we're all out. You know what I'm mm. saying? No one else is going to believe you. And, and he looks at everyone else that they're dysfunctional and he's and he's the truthful one. They'll never take responsibility for their action because they're 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 trained liars. Start talking that way and you're gonna see and you're gonna have schosim. Those are the words he told me. I said, Rebbe, but I can't do it. My daughter's screaming and throwing up in pain. I can't do it. He says, just do it. Just do it. And I started to talk that way. Whenever she would be in pain, I would say, Hashem, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. This is towards really the last few weeks of her life, and I knew she's dying. And I knew this just going backwards when her body broke out with blisters and, and boils. And I knew that's the infection going through the blood, through the skin, through the flesh, through the skin and out. I know there's no way out. She has no counts in her body to fight for survival. Um, so I knew that she's going to die from this infection because that's, I mean, when you're in the ninth floor in Sloan Kettering, you see this every week and you know you're next. You're literally yeah. living, you're waiting in line to get into that gas chamber. That's the experience, you know? So living like that for a few months in exile, in darkness, helped me understand through dark, 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 I was able to start understanding and comprehending that I'm lucky. That I'm lucky that now that she's dying, I'm the lucky one that I was able to do a service for my creator, which only I can do. And no one else could have done because otherwise Hashem would have gave this child to somebody else. I knew this is not a result of my actions because otherwise I would die, not her. Again, I'm not God, but to me it made sense that, you know, that Sadekis is leaving this world. Um, it only makes sense that she's being a kapar for Klal Yisrael and Hashem can only give it to those who can withstand it. Not even once did she complain about her situation, why me, why me, but rather, how do I deal with it? Gave me chizik to understand, look, I'm not looking to live like a victim. I want to live as a hero. I want to be able to take what Hashem is doing to me and turn it into bracha by accepting, by more than accepting, by being thankful to Hashem. Thank you, Hashem, for giving me a daughter that I can make a Kiddush Hashem with. Thank you for believing me that only I can do this for you. Thank you for giving me an Hashem, which I'm now, we're going to return to you bigger and better than you gave her to me. I'm giving her back to you. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to do a service for Klal Yisrael through living in, 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 in MSK, where I'm more Sloan Kettering, in the ninth floor in darkness, complete darkness. I was not allowed to turn on the lights in the room. Um, because it just didn't, you know, she lost her vision uh, due to the chemotherapy. So any sort of light, even from a phone screen, we used to drive her crazy. So wow. while everyone is partying in August, sending kids to camp, then bungalow colony or wherever they may be, I'm sitting in August in a dark room, no lights on, silent, no sound, no noise, no nothing. I'm just sitting and staring at the walls from morning to night. And I felt like the luckiest man in the world that I am now doing a service for my creator. And when you start living that way, when you start understanding that Hashem is in it for, for uh, this is chesed that Hashem is doing with me. Oh, how does that amount to chesed? Uh, someone's dying here and you're in pain. It's your daughter. How is that chesed? The answer is, to me, I looked at it as chesed because the Svar Mekadashim teach us that Hashem doesn't do any evil to His people. Why did Hashem create a world? Hashem needs humans now. I mean, he's busy with Malachim and Shemaim, doing tremendous things in Shemaim, with the Tyre and Shemaim. Hashem needs now Klal Yisrael, Moshe Rabbeinu, all the Gaim of the world, the Mishagasin of humans. You think Hashem wants to be busy with that? Hashem has nothing better to do with his time to deal with all flaws of human nature? The answer is Hashem created human nature for one purpose, Lehetiv Imbar, only to do good for his people. And without a people, Hashem cannot perfect himself in being good. So Hashem Kivyachal created us in order to be able to do good for His people. So I know that what Hashem is doing to me is good for me. And I know what Hashem is doing for me, for my daughter, is good for my daughter. And I know what Hashem is doing to my family is the best thing for my family. And I said, Mizmar Lataida, every single day. I looked at David Amelov's life and I said, here is a man that was on the run his entire life from his brothers, from his father, from his father-in-law, from his son, from his enemies. The man's a king. He deserves to, to, to lead with, you know, on, a, on his throne. Instead, he's hiding, starving in Midbar Yehuda. And what's his response? Thank you, Hashem. Ms. Wow. Taida. So I said, that was David HaMelech's, uh, you know, uh, uh, that was David HaMelech's it Baladut. By writing Ms. Tehillim thing, and that's why we're in pain. That's what we read, Tehillim, right? Because we, we sort of want to feel the relief David HaMelech felt, the closure which he felt, and that is to know that I'm not alone. 
Shifta ha mishatech ha heimayna hamuni. Otcha kan itani of tili lishua. That, you know, that everything that is happening to me is because you love me, it's because you believe in me, it's because you care for me. If I was X'd off your list, I, I would have the perfect life. Hashem would throw billions of dollars on me. I'd be a lottery winner. And I would just live out my life, you know, without having to ever have a relationship with my creator. But through darkness, I was able to make a relationship with my creator, which I never had before. And it allowed me to work on my bitachon, allowed me to work on my imuna, to know not just to say it, but to believe that what happened to my daughter is the best thing that ever happened to her. And whatever happened to me as a result is the best thing that ever happened to me. And I was promised I would see bracha. And I have abnormal bracha in my life. I remember the day my daughter passed away. I remember looking at her and I was kissing all her boils. And I said, these tzarot, these boils got you in the greatest place in Shemayim. You went from being in tremendous pain 10 seconds ago because she passed away in my arms. And I remember playing with her hair as, you know, she was dead. And I was kissing her and, and I said, you right, I was crying, but inside a believe Sameach and saying to myself, I'm so lucky knowing that I was able to get my daughter now to the greatest place I in Shemaim, cutting the line, you know, no din v'cheshben. She's right now this second with Sarah and Rachel, Rivka, uh, with all the imaot, with, 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 with Miriam playing music in Shemaim right now. And... A second ago, she was, you know, with a seizure, grasping for air, and literally a second later, she's in the greatest place in Shemayim, and the greatest pleasure for eternity, in perpetuity. And here I am, stuck in this world, saying to myself, I'm a hero, but I made right there a commitment saying, I hope, I, I know I have the greatest place in Shemayim one day waiting for me. My daughter will pull me in. As long as I don't do anything stupid to mess it up, right? Don't do anything dumb where Hashem gets angry at me. Um, I will one day leave this world, hopefully, going to the same place she went because I was able to have the schus to be her father. And my wife and I put her on that level to be able to handle her years the way she did to enter Gan Eden. So I looked at her and I said, you know, her last conversation in this world was with Rabbi Walken. It was a Monday. And she died on Wednesday and Rosh Hashanah was on Friday. I remember the Monday that they, um, when her body finally gave up, so she felt no more pain. And this happens to people before they die. All of a sudden they feel bliss, like wow. no pain, no anything, because the body stopped fighting. The fevers were going down because the body lost pretty much. And then, then the, eventually the infection just takes you. So she was on the phone with Rabbi Walken and she said, what's my avoda for Rosh Hashanah? <laughs> In other words, I can't read from a mavzer, she was saying to him, because I'm blind. So I can't make out the words. I can't get out of bed to go hear shofar. Because I'm stuck in bed. I can't walk. I can't, I can't do anything for myself. So what's my avayda? And I remember when he told her, I said, your avayda is to fight. That's, just, that's, your, that's all it's demand. We'll do everything else for you. You're, you're pater from everything else. Your avayda is to fight. Then after that conversation, she completely lost it. And we were never able to have a normal conversation with her again. Wow. And that's how she died. But she left this world with that question in mind. That was how she left this world. I remember standing in front of my Kila on Yom Kippur and I told him right before Eli, I said, this is how this girl left this world. It was Arab Roshana when I spoke to him. I said, exactly two years ago today, she left this world with one question in mind. What's what is my to? avodah? I said, she's going to hold all of us accountable who are healthy, who can see, who can run. She's going to hold all of us accountable that have all those advantages, who don't stop for a moment to ask themselves or their creator, what is my avoda this year? Just go through another year, just like that. Just get over with the davening. Oh, beautiful tkiot, great chazan, great selling, and just go home and eat. She, that's what she left in this world, and I'm lucky to be her dad. Wow. wow. And 30 days after she passed away, my wife gave birth to a baby boy. That's wow. when the bracha started to come in. Of course, I walked in with Sandak. Wow. And I remember looking at him, my son, and he was born literally under Shleshim. Wow. And and, and at the same time she died, he was born. And the same machines my daughter was connected to, my wife was connected to, uh, when she was giving birth. And it was very emotional for me because uh, uh, 30 days ago, I saw that machine stop, you know? And here, 30 days later, I see that machine going up and down, up and down. And in a minute, in a matter of 30 days, a baby boy, we're Sephardic, right? A boy on her shleshim. <laughs> To me, that was like grand slam. Wow. And I remember looking at him in his bris and I said, how am I gonna feed you? I have no money. I just got out of the hospital. Two years of sitting there with nothing, a broken man. 
and I have a bunch of kids at home. How am I going to feed this kid? And I remember right, walking was telling me after the break, like, we really have to talk today of what you're doing going forward. And I said, I don't even have a plan. But we'll talk, but I don't have a plan. Oh. And, you know, going fast forward two years later, I'm working. I'm involved in real estate. I'm oh, sure. involved in management. I have the opportunity to be able to teach Tyra for free. Wow. Because I have a Parnassa. I'm able to um, fulfill her wishes by getting a safe Tyra, by starting a bit Midrash. My wife gave birth to another girl a few months ago, uh, uh, six months, uh, seven months ago. My wife gave birth to, oh, excuse me, February, 10 months ago. <laughs> I lost track. You know, we're up to 10 kids, Kanai and Hara. Mean, uh, you know, wow. I, I'm able to so pay my bills. Wow, unbelievable. There's heat on in my house. So you turn pain into a purpose. Unbelievable. And so my pain amounted to purpose by not allowing to allow myself to live like a victim, rather live like myself like a hero. I always use Israel as an example, you know. The Arabs are always moping, oh, we're, 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 we're living in, in these camps, refugee camps, because we were thrown out of our houses by the Israelis, and therefore we can't develop ourselves, and look how we live, and look how we live, and look how we live. And Lumadze, uh, in, in comparison to that, you look at Eretz Israel, Israel, how that became an establishment. You know, yeah. we also came Sorry. broken, Holocaust survivors. The country was built on broken men and broken women, um, who built a country for themselves, surrounded by wolves, okay, and became the greatest produ production company, uh, production country in the Middle East. You know, any, I mean, the computers we work today are manufactured technology in Israel, all technology. Right. And you would think that, you know, that, that, that they should be the greatest victims in the world. Who should they thank for all that? The Arabs who are down their backs, because had the Arabs left them alone, they wouldn't have the best security in the world. They would not invent the greatest technology. They would never be two steps ahead. They always have to be two steps, 10 steps ahead because they're up against the wall by an enemy who, who's looking to slaughter them. Wow. So ordeals and darknesses and situations of exile, which I experienced, only brings out the best of the person if you allow it to. But there's two options you face. You know, it was very, a lot easier for me in the hospital to be on my game Calls my, uh, as long as my daughter was alive because I remember having a conversation with, my, with the doctor saying your daughter is not going to make it How do you want her to leave this world? And, and that was like probably the most nauseous conversation I had in the hospital when I was there I remember like a week before she died We had to figure out and sign paperwork how should we put on a respirator? Should we pull the plug? Should we give her this medication stat? And I'm like this is the only option I have right now is to discuss What option I want to choose for her to leave this world? It was <sighs> gruesome and I remember throwing up after that conversation. And I go back to her room. I'm like, Efrat, how you doing? All upbeat because why should she feel that there's, right. that there's anything wrong here? So I had no option but to be on my game. But I remember after she passed away, after my son was born, after I fell back into society, also I'm looking back and I'm saying, now I do have options, right? Now I can choose to be depressed and no one will stop me. But I fought it and I fought it and I fought it. And that pain which I had, the purpose of that was to allow me to appreciate the light which is in my life. And I, and I have abnormal bracha because of it. And, and that's a message to everybody, you know? We suffer with pain, right? There's not one person which we know that doesn't experience pain in his life, all right? Be it, you know, uh, uh, domestic uh, 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 issues in the marriage, right? Domestic issues tranquility. With marriage, issues with be children, it raising with children, children. With health, whatever. It might livelihood. Be like, a, a, a lady in the workplace is driving your wife crazy. Uh, a, a, a boss is down there on your back or whatever because you're not producing good or whatever it may be. You know, these are things which throw us off a bit. These are things which, uh, you know, which we have to deal with. These are ordeals which can break you, but if you look at it as an opportunity, as opposed to a uh, verdict, right? You can turn, you can literally turn it around by making an opportunity. And then when you look at it that way, and you say, Hashem, this is the best thing. The words coming out of my boss's mouth is exactly what I needed to hear right now. Oh, the words coming out of my wife's right now, mouth right now is exactly what I need to hear right now. Or wherever it may be that's, that you're not getting along with, when you accept it, that that's the position you're in right now is exactly the position I want you to be in, but you want to see how you react, and you become a hero because of it by looking for the opportunity as opposed to looking at the verdict in it, your life will turn around. Rabbi, very inspiring, very touchy. Um, you discussed how uh, you took the pain and you made it into purpose. How about others that are going through pain? What can one do for other people? Others are no different. Again, I'm a regular person, grew up in a regular home, not knowing what my value is. And I've come to learn that, and this is a message for everyone. Look, 
This is no offense to anyone personal. I used to weigh 250, 260 pounds. No way. Big, fat, <laughs> overgrown, plump. All right? Okay. And the only times I tried to lose weight, multiple times, I tried to lose weight. And I, every time, okay, we'll replenish again on Sunday, right? We'll start. And sh I gained more weight just by eating on Shabbat by saying, because well, Sunday I have to stop, right? <laughs> so, so I would eat extra on Shabbat knowing that tomorrow's my diet, so let me enjoy it now. This happened every week, and I realized I'm 10 pounds more, except instead of going. <laughs> Forwards, I'm going backwards. The reason is because every single human being has light. Hashem created us with R. A lot of light, which Hashem wants to shine upon us. Light, in other words, bracha. The problem is we don't have, our vessels are not big enough to be able to contain that light. Every smoker wishes he could stop. You see people dying, just stop. The answer is, First, you're in denial, saying, to me, it won't happen, to me, or the other way around. First, you really want to quit, but then you, when you can't quit, you start making it right, saying, oh, to me, it's not going to happen, blah, 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 fine. But every person deep down knows when he takes a puff, he's not, definitely not taking in organic uh, uh, minerals into his body, okay? He's, he's taking in deadly, uh, deadly stuff into, into his system. Why does he do it? He really want, he'd really rather not to, but the vessels which he has are not big enough to be able to contain the light. Same thing happens until finally I made up my mind, I'm going to lose the weight no matter what. And I remember quitting smoking and I said, I'm going to start running in order not to eat more. Because when you stop smoking, you have a tendency to eat even more. So now it's not going to be Shabbos I'm eating more. It's going to be every day of the week eating more because the cigarettes are going to explode. So I said, that's stopping and I'm going to start, you know, disciplining myself to start running. And, and that's how I lost the weight. And it was a losing weight, but by default to quit smoking. Great. So I got both of what I wanted by making up my mind. What, so how come I failed the first 20 times? The answer is I wasn't shooken up. And when I realized that I'm not going to make it to a nursing home 400 pounds with the tennis balls in the bottom of the walker asking for a light for my cigarette because the 400 pounder who's smoking doesn't make it to the nursing home with the tennis balls in the bottom. And that shook me up. I said, I don't want to end up like that. I don't want to end up not making it. I mean, I don't want to end up in nursing home period, but I don't want to, I want to be in that bracket one day where I could live a long life. And I know with my two habits right now, it's not happening. And it shook me up. And, and that's why I made that decision. I'm not going back to it. And I'm going to push and do it right. And then, as it was so painful, the withdrawal of not having nicotine in your body and not having sugar in your body and not having anything which I was liked in my body. I remember it was October and November time. I was sweating in the middle of the night, cold sweat. And I knew this is my body acting from withdrawal. And I was so proud of myself for suffering because I deserved what was coming to me. Because look how much the negativity can take over. It's, it's, it's hurting me. I'm in pain right now because I'm lacking all this stuff and I'm dying to just run out to 7-Eleven and buy a pack of smokes and a coffee with a lot of sugar just to get my mojo back. But I said no this time because I allowed myself to develop the vessels I needed in order to be able to contain the light. And then I lost the weight and I quit smoking and never went back to it. No chachma to lose weight. Anyone can lose weight. How do you keep it off? That's, that's the chachma. I was able to do both because I'm special. No, because I realized I was lacking vessels. <laughs> Let's take that into life. When you're going through darkness, that is the purpose right there is to turn that pain which you're going through into the greatest joy in the world because what Hashem is doing to you right now is giving you the opportunity which we discussed. The opportunity to be able to create vessels, to be able to receive all the bracha which Hashem wants to give you. Mm. And to that point in my life, I don't know, maybe I had bracha, maybe I didn't, I, I definitely didn't see it as such. Or appreciate it. Now that, you know, I, I, I know what it's like to live being separated from my children. So now that I have a bunch of little kids at home, I'm a father all over again. I feel like I'm 20 now. When I'm really 40. <laughs> you know, I feel like I'm 20 all over again. I'm running after kids in the middle of the night and I love it. I used to not be able to stand it. I need my sleep, blah, blah, blah. And now I'm all over it. I get up for the kids and I play with them and I'll talk to them, this and that. A bunch of little kids I have at home, Baruch Hashem. You know, my wife gave birth and three kids in three years since my daughter's second time around until now, three kids. You know, and a bunch of teenagers as well, you know, which only give me anachas and bracha. You know, so we go through the ordeals we go through in order to be able to build vessels because Hashem wants a relationship with you. And Hashem wants you to have a relationship with Him. If you have everything in the bank and everything is going good in your life, how is that an opportunity to have a relationship with your Creator? He's lasting on your mind. So what Hashem does, He takes that away from you just for a bit in order for you to be able to turn your muzzle around to bring it back. And there's many methods and ways to do it. Now is not the time to discuss that. But at the end of the day, 
when you're going through dark time, remember, light can only come through cracks. Light doesn't come when everything is sealed. When you have a broken heart, when, you're, 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 when your heart is cracked, that's when the light comes in. But you have to allow the light in. To block it and to make yourself a victim and, and trying to get into someone else's lane or trying to, you know, uh, 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 deny what you're going through or, or, blame, or shifting it on others, you know, projecting it, that's not going to get you far. By accepting it and being thankful for it and then developing tools to work with it, the vessels to work with it, then you have now a real relationship with your creator, a relationship where you have trust in your creator, a relationship where you have bitachon and muna in your creator, where, where, where you have faith in your creator, a relationship where you know that whatever's happening to you is as much as we want to do for our children, Hashem wants to do so much more for us. You know, we want to give our kids everything because that's the nature for a father. To do. Hashem's will is much greater than that, right, to do for us. We just have to make it active. And the way to activate it is by being thankful and accepting and knowing that what you're going through, you should be dancing because it's the greatest thing that could be happening to you. Because right now, through the cleansing process, you are creating vessels to be able to have tolerance and have a, a receptacle to be able to get all that bracha in there. And that only comes through pain. Wow. It's never going to come when you're you know, living in Switzerland and the Bahamas, <laughs> you know, or in the Bahamas. Switzerland produces zero for the world, except Rolexes, which people get ripped off on, and good chocolate, <laughs> which people gain weight on. Other than that, they did nothing for the world. You would think that country will produce everything because they have all the resources. They, you go to Switzerland, the country shuts down 1 o'clock till 4, 4, 4 or 5 o'clock. The trisses are down. You know, everyone's going to sleep with their wives. Wow. The government pays all your bills. The best life in the world, right? You go to Israel, a press country, you would think that they would produce zero to the world because they're busy always being in survival mode. Mm -hmm. No. You can only bring out the best when you're in struggle. When you're no struggle in your life, you're nothing. And that's really the curse which Hashem gave the Nachash. Think about it. The serpent, his curse was, and he was responsible for all of them, his curse was, you lose your taste buds, and you lose your arm and legs, and you have food all the time at your disposal, the earth or the ground. That's the best curse in the world. Hey, everything he eats tastes like steaks, right? Because <laughs> he doesn't know what, what no it tastes like. You know, so he doesn't know what tastes, he doesn't know what he's missing out on. Damn, that's steak. Well, he doesn't know anything better, right? And he has, he has nothing to struggle for. He doesn't have to lift a fork. It's all coming to him. No, that's Hashem's way of saying, I don't want to have any relationship with you. No relationship with you. Know? You're going to have the best life in the world. But Adam, the sweat of your brow, and Chava, which you have to lead him through pain, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to bring forth you know, children to the world. That is a curse, but through that curse is a bracha, if you turn it around. And by turning it around, the way to do that, the first ingredient is being thankful. Giving Hashem shira, giving Hashem praise, giving Hashem, uh, 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 you know, uh, submitting to your Creator, and, and, and being thankful to your Creator for your situation right now, will bring you the greatest life, light ever, which you can experience. It's working for me. And, and if it's working for me and I did nothing to deserve it, it's not like I did some great thing in my life. I dealt with my situation. Hashem sent something my way. And instead of being angry and upset and, being, and, and moping and living like a victim, I, I chose to work hard and, and, and become a hero because of it, as opposed to becoming a zero or a nobody. You know, and live my whole life like a schnar saying, oh, give me because I can't produce, I can't do anything. You know, living like, you know, with being entitled, I'm not entitled to anything. And, you know, if Hashem gave this to you, it's because He wants you to work. And when you work, you will see results. It worked for me, it could work for anyone. Amazing. That's the bottom line. You know, and, that, and that's my message, you know, to, uh, to anyone who's going through a personal struggle. Remember that that struggle, you know, you're caught up in a bad relationship. You know, you're married and there's toxicity around, turn it around. Pray to Hashem. Pray to Hashem to give you the vessels to be able to deal with your spouse. I'm not saying just, if the person's a narcissist, if the person's abusing you, if you're going through something emotional, of course, seek help. Sometimes it's a mitzvah to get out of such a relationship, you know. But my point is, don't make yourself the victim. On the contrary, find where you can grow from this. Find where you can develop vessels to get closer to your creator. You look for that, Hashem will put it out there for you. You just have to go for, find it and search it. It's there. You just have to un, 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 unwrap it and unpackage it. That's my advice to everyone who's going through a personal struggle. That's, that, that's it. So I always say this. It's not just going through life, but growing through life. Taking whatever you're that's going you through grow. to grow. And uh, don't live bitter, but live better. You know, right. bitter things unfortunately happen in life. Darkness happens, but we have to try to choose. But bitter is life. better. If you can take bitter, and, 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 and bitter is there for you to make it better. You know, um, 
Uh, hardships. That, 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 exactly that. What, what makes a person feel bitter? Oh, I'm unlucky. Oh, I have no Parnassa. It's a terrible ordeal. I, I, I went through it. You know, um, I, I, oh, I'm, I'm unlucky. My child's dead. You know, that's bitter. It's super bitter. It doesn't get worse, more bitter than that. But I look at it as better right now. You know, my life is better because of it. I, I was able to take that bitterness and add a lot of sugar to it and, and make it the sweetest thing ever. Do I miss my daughter? Tremendously. I think about her every day. I talk about her in public. You know, I have no shame. I don't have any, you know, I, no filter when it comes to talking about that. Because if it gives some chizik, why not? But in the end of the and day... I know for a fact many families that went through difficulties, the rabbi did go to the families and give them... Because it's the only way. Because it's the only you've way. You've been there, done that. Some of Rabbi Wallace seems that's all. Mm -hmm. He's had many challenges and he says these challenges were the best things for me. You know why? Because now you can deliver. I've been there, done that, and now Correct. I can give it over to somebody Correct. else. And that's how I look at Powerful. at least my situation right now. I'm healthy. I want to use that to be able to do as much as possible on my you know, time which, which Hashem gives me to be able to help, you know, people, people are in need. Amazing. Unbelievable. Rabbi Yosef Chaim, what an inspiration, what a chizuk you've <laughs> given to me and definitely to the whole world, uh, everyone watching and listening to this. Rabbi, we have a minaga custom. The Torah talks one final message that you could give to all of us. Be besimcha. <laughs> know that your creator loves you. Uh. And your creator wants to do only good for you. He has no intentions to do any harm to you whatsoever. And change the way you look at things. Yosef at Tzadik was thrown in a dungeon. This week's partial. He's asking people why they look sad. Butler and, and, oh, and, and the baker. Why are you sad? Yeah, why are you sad? Are, 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 are you having <laughs> your <in> jail. mind? <laughs> Come uh, on. Uh, what exactly? I mean, we're, we're not playing poker here. You know, we're in jail. We'll never see daylight again. Like, what exactly are we supposed to be thrilled about? What in kind of jail, questions not like we have today. Yeah. And it's not jail as we have today. You know, you get visitation rights and parole and you hire a lawyer. You have the right to remain silent. No right, nothing. You're, you're, you're in off. The right home. And, and he's, and he's besimcha. How do you explain that? Yosef looked at his dreams as a reality. One day the world will bow down to me. And he did not move from that a millimeter. And because he believed in that, and because he knew that's going to come to fruition, he focused on the prize. He did not focus on the ordeal. He focused on the ball. If you play basketball now for three, four hours, play, you're dribbling, you're breaking your legs, arms, no problem. You're getting back in there with a cast, whatever. You, you can't wait to get back in there. Why? Playing basketball, shooting basketball. If I come to you and say, wow, you guys are doing this for three hours, give me the ball for a second. Do the same thing. Continue doing the same thing. You're not going to be able to do it more than a minute. Dribble, do everything you did without a ball this time. And I'm your coach. I'm watching you. How long do you do it for? Not even a minute. Maybe three minutes the most. I often puffing, you need water, Gatorade. <laughs> what, what happened? Three, a minute ago, you're playing for three hours. I took the ball away. Now you can't play at all? The answer is because when you're playing with the ball and you're doing, following all the rules of basketball, you're not focusing on the fact that you're exerting yourself. You're not focusing on the fact that you're hurting yourself. You're not focusing on the fact that you're out of breath and that you need a drink. You're focusing on the ball. And that is the game, that is the game of life. You know, if we're going to focus on all our shortcomings and our misfortunes and all our, oh, look at my life and this and that, we're going to get nowhere. Yossi focused on the ball. I'm going to be king one day. Wow. And that's because I had the dream. And I know that's going to happen. And this is a message for someone who's in a bad marriage. If you're about to get divorced, you're looking to get divorced, and that's what you should be doing, right? And the rabbi tells you that, consider yourself divorced. Consider yourself living the right day after. All right? Consider yourself, and then you, don't, you create a block where you don't let any toxicity get inside of you. That is our job as humans, is to create walls around us that don't allow any toxicity from society, from negative people, from negative attitude which you have inside your soul. You can create that barrier, you're set for life. Amazing, Rabbi Asaf Chaim of Chazak Umarach and Shekar Chagdid Torah. Thank you. Thank you. Every single Tuesday night, Chazak Torah Talks with special guests, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Shout out to Tony Time for hosting this Torah Talk along with all the other platforms and podcasts and the entire Kazakh team, Natan Behar and Rabbi Abov and Natan and Izzy and Mayor and everyone involved, really appreciate it. Shout out to Daily Giving, a dollar a day goes very far away. Big shout out to Rabbi Yanni Zero for all his endless work. He doesn't stop, man's on fire. Thank you. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Thank you.